Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacob Moreno. I'm one of the staff uh, from the Toronto General Hospital, and I'm going to be presenting this uh, T for management of non cardiac uh, transplant. I have uh, no disclosures to disclose uh, with the audience. And the objective of uh, this uh, presentation is going to be uh, to have a better idea on how to use the transesophageal echo in the non-cardiac uh, transplantation and how to use the transesophageal echo as a rescue tool in those situations. The first case that we are presenting is a kidney pancreas transplant. Uh, on a 46-year-old male that has a past medical history significant for hypertension, dyslipidemia, polycystic uh, kidney disease with uh, chronic kidney disease on peritoneal dialysis, and history of celiac disease and alpha thalassemia. The transthoracic echocardiography uh, pre-op show a normal left ventricle, normal right ventricle, and no valvular abnormalities. An indication in this situation uh, for transesophageal echo was hemodynamic instability once the transplant started. As we can see in this example, we start with the picture on the left side of the screen. We have a left ventricle and a right ventricle from a four, five chamber view, um, mid-esophageal view, where you can see perfectly, like as the left ventricle is very reduced inside, very hyperdynamic, same principle uh, can be applied to the right ventricle. And then the image on the right is a zoom view over the mitral valve and the LVOT tract, where you can see the yellow flow acceleration, which represents flow acceleration through the LVOT and a posteriorly directed jet into the mitral valve. If we pay close attention uh, to this image, we can see that the patient has a very thick ventricle, and then when we see like the septum is enlarged, anything more than 1.1 centimeters is considered hypertrophied, and then you can see that during systole, you have the anterior mitral valve leaflet uh, occupying like uh, the LVOT uh, tract. When that happens, and as you well know, this is considered SAM, and in that situation, uh, that can cause a lot of hemodynamic instability. If we go to the stomach, uh, to the transgastric view, short axis of the left and right ventricle, we can see how those two ventricles are reduced in size, how they are completely collapsed. It's uh, what we call like the fish mouth. And then this situation was happening with norepinephrine at 0.2 mics per kilo per minute with a blood pressure that was 79 over 43 and a tachycardia, sinus tachycardia of 180 uh, beats per minute. So what should we do? So we approached the anesthetic team. We recommended them to actually give a bolus of esmolol, one liter bolus, and then we were able with that to reduce the norepinephrine from 0.2 to 0.05. Uh, with an adequate pressure, the systolic was into the one tenths. And as you can see in that image, uh, this left ventricle is not so hyperdynamic now, it's not so empty, and it's working much better. If we go up to the mid-esophageal view again, we have uh, this four-chamber view in the left side, where you can see how both ventricles now uh, feel and how they are contracting fine, but not in a hyperdynamic manner. How if we put color now, there is not so much flow acceleration to the LVOT, we cannot see any mitral regurgitation either. If we go to the long axis view of the aortic valve, it's an ideal image to, to assess for LVOT acceleration, like in the five chamber view that we got before. And then as you can see here, there is very, mi very minimal uh, mitral regurgitation. There is a little bit of flow acceleration in the LVOT, but nothing compared to before. And as you can see in the lower image uh, and the 2D, you can definitely see that the anterior mitral leaflet is not get sucked into the LVOT. Uh, when we measure, uh, here is the ideal uh, image uh, to measure the thickness of the LV because it's comparable to the parasternal long axis in the transthoracic, uh, and we measure a septum of 1.55 centimeters. 
uh, anything more than uh, 15 millimeters is considered severe septal hypertrophy and it should be measured in end diastole. So we left the probe in the patient just in case that they needed to assess the patient and then unfortunately like 40 minutes later we will call in because the patient is again unstable, they have been given more fluid but then it's, uh, it's, it's not enough and the patient is dropping the pressure again and the requirements of norepi are increasing. When we come in, the CVP, we realize it came down from 15 to 7. And again, when that happens, as you can see, again, both ventricles hyperdynamic to try to compensate that. Uh, super thick left ventricle, very anti, very hyperdynamic. And as you can see, again, we can see some, and then we can see flux acceleration in the LVOT, and we can see, again, mitral regurgitation. So what we decided to do in this situation is give another uh, liter of uh, volume. And as you can see, it's a little bit better, it's still uh, very hyperdynamic, but basically uh, our management and our recommendation is to run a little bit of uh, esmolol, even if it's necessary an esmolol infusion to slow down those patients and fulfill them. The patient did fine after the, after the surgery. So the second case that we're going to be presented here is a single lung transplantation patient. Um, this was a 60-year-old uh, male that got a previous history of uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, recurring chemo radiation, complicated with ARVS, and unfortunately for the patient pulmonary fibrosis, requiring a, a single lung transplant uh, on, the, on the time of, uh, the, of, the, of the case. Uh, other past significant past medical history, the patient was uh, got uh, hypertension, coronary artery disease with a PCI, uh, recurring a barometer stent to the LAD and OSA on CPAP. The pre-op uh, transthoracic echo show a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, an aortic valve area as close of one centimeter to the square, but uh, normal main gradients of uh, 19 and a left ventricle ejection fraction mainly down to 52%, moderately uh, down a right ventricle systolic function and mild to moderate tachycardia regurgitation with dilatation of the ascending aorta at 43 millimeters. In this situation, uh, the surgeons wanted to go straight on ECMO to do the transplant, so the decision was uh, not to perform a, T, uh, a, a TE unless necessary, but unfortunately, after induction, the patient became uh, extremely uh, hemodynamically unstable. In a situation with a patient with pulmonary hypertension and hypotension, we always need to assess uh, the performance of the right ventricle. Uh, in this case, we uh, tilted the probe from a mid esophageal four chamber view into a modified four chamber view where we exposed the right ventricle. Then the right ventricle uh, function was evaluated in this case by fractional change, which was 22% considering that like moderate RV dysfunction. On the right side of the screen, uh, we were using a right ventricular strain of the free wall, which is uh, 0.84 accurate with uh, MRI for measuring uh, systolic uh, function of the right ventricle. And uh, we are using that using a technology of a speckle tracking. Uh, the RVS strain was down in the mid and apical free walls of the right ventricle, where the normal value should be always below uh, to minus 25%. Uh, the calculated right ventricle ejection fraction was 32.5%. When in normal conditions, uh, it should be uh, above 45% uh, at least. Whenever we have um, uh, a bad ventricular, uh, a bad right ventricular function, it's always a good idea to check for the degree of tricuspid regurgitation. We knew from the pre-op uh, transthoracic that it has like mild to moderate uh, uh, TR. Um, but then whenever you have at least moderate uh, tricuspid regurgitation, the RV uh, function is always going to be overestimated. So as in this example, the vena contractor was measured as 0.5, consistent with moderate TR. And uh, by measuring the TR, you can to measure the right ventricular systolic pressures. And as we know, like it was mild pulmonary hypertension. In this case, the uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressures were estimated at 51. 
So the next uh, uh, step that we took, we went into the stomach, transgastric, X-plane over the short axis of the LV, and, the and we are presenting on the right side a 90 degrees uh, in phase view of the uh, LV uh, from the lateral aspect. And then, then we assessed the left ventricular ejection fraction, and it was moderately down, no mildly down as expected by the, by the preoperative uh, transthoracic echo. We use the same string technology for the left ventricle, and we were able to calculate an ejection fraction around 40 to 43%. It was consistent with uh, at least a moderately down uh, LV function. In this image, uh, you can present anything that is, um, is the bull size view, and anything that is red means that you have shrinking of the longitudinal strain of the left ventricle and anything that is blue is uh, the ones that are a little bit dyskinetic and instead of actually shrinking they are even getting a little bit bigger which showing you the the zones of the left ventricle where the left ventricle is not performing appropriately We then uh, went to the aortic valve in the long axis view, normally at 130, in this situation was 146. As you can see here, there is a flow acceleration through the aortic valve. We already knew there were some gradients. There is, there, there is a little bit of uh, aortic regurgitation too, as you can see in the static image on the right side of the screen. And you have it there, that's the jet coming towards us. So we measure that the vena contracta was only 0.2, and we did uh, the relationship between the jet and the LVOT, and it was uh, all consistent with uh, mild aortic regurgitation and moderate uh, aortic stenosis. This is a short axis view of the aortic valve where we have the known, the left, and the right coronary cusp, and as you can see, between the left and the right coronary cusp. Over here, there is a raphe, that's the bicuspid aortic valve, and as you can see, that's the only place where the aortic valve is, uh, is actually opening, okay? We did the gradients, velocity 0.4 uh, meters per second, and mean gradient only 16, but those are under anesthetic conditions. The, the aortic valve area that we calculate was 1.4 and not 1.0 as uh, calculated in the uh, as calculated in the in the pre-op uh, transthoracic echo. We decided to go to the intraatrial septum from a bicaval view, coronary sinus, right atrium, left atrium, intraatrial septum. Just uh, to be sure that we don't have any hypoxia here, we decreased a little bit the scale, and there was no PFO here. So what should we do? So we have a, a patient with moderate right ventricular dysfunction and unexpected uh, moderate LV dysfunction, probably related to mild hypotension after induction. Uh, we knew that the patient had moderate tricuspid regurgitation and there's an estimation of moderate aortic stenosis. So the final decision was to cannulate the patient and went into BA ECMO centrally. So after the single lung transplant was performed, the next step is how to win this patient from uh, uh, BA ECMO. This is something that I'm going to reserve uh, for the fourth case that we are going to be presenting today, and I will show you how to use transesophageal echo to win from ECMO. So the third case that we are presenting today is going to be a liver transplant patient, 67-year-old uh, female, with end-stage uh, liver disease secondary to fulminant hepatic failure and uh, past medical history significant uh, for hypertension, uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, the patient got a transthoracic uh, echo preoperatively, which showed a small left ventricle, asymmetric left ventricle hypertrophy with a septum of 15 millimeters. Uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, which was normal, some systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflets, and pressure gradients post valsalva up to 94 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the right ventricle was normal, and there was only trivial tricuspid regurgitation, and most importantly, there was no mitral regurgitation. So the indication in this case uh, to do the transesophageal echo 
was uh, because we knew all that high risk for some, high risk for LVOT gradients, as we saw in the previous uh, case of uh, the kidney transplant patient, and we just wanted to have good intraoperative monitoring. So in this patient, what we want to do is check the left ventricular function, check the left ventricular thickness. As you can see here, there is sev severe asymmetric uh, septal hypertrophy involving the basal, mid-anterior, anterolateral, and anteroseptal walls. The maximum septum was measured as uh, 1.6 uh, centimeters, and in this case, we couldn't see SAM. But uh, just pay attention uh, to, the, to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, which is uh, thickened distally with uh, malcoaptations at the center. So if we put uh, colorful Doppler in this uh, four-chamber view and long-axis view of the of the aortic valve, what we can see is a centrally a little bit uh, more towards the anterior directed jet, and we were not able to see some here. We check for flow acceleration to the LVOT. At the time, there was not uh, such acceleration, but instead we find mild to moderate MR, but centrally directed, not posteriorly directed as is supposed to be when you have some. So we check in this uh, situation for right ventricular function. We realize uh, about uh, how big this right atrium, uh, as you can see in the left side of the screen, was and how the intraatrial septum was actually bulging into the left atrium. Then we check uh, for PFO and there was none. And we put color into the tricuspid valve. And when we have a big anonymous dilatation with a gigantic right atrium, so what you are going to expect is to have a tricuspid regurgitation. So if we keep assessing for the tricuspid, so we go to the inflow outflow view and we can appreciate how this RA is such like su is such a big RA, okay, and how bad this uh, tricuspid regurgitation is. This is severe tricuspid regurgitation and definitely is the last thing that you want to have when you are doing a liver transplant. So you can do assessment. Uh, we were able to measure the regurgitant jet of the tricuspid uh, uh, bulb was up to 60 uh, milliliters, consistent, consistent with severe and uh, effective regurgitant area of uh, 1.3 centimeters to the square, uh, which is uh, extremely, extremely bad for the patient. We went um, into the hepatic vein uh, following the IVC, and when you have a severe TR, um, you want to know how, how your, your liver is going to be affected. Uh, when you go there, you check with pulse width Doppler, and then when we check with pulse width Doppler, we confirm systolic uh, reversal of the hepatic vein flow. We keep examining the patient, and again, remember, transesophageal echo can help us to determine more things uh, during an examination, included, as you can see here, a right side of pleural effusion, like this case. You can trace the area and determine how important it is. So if the area is less than 20 centimeters, we have a small pleural effusion, less than 400 mils. If it's between 20 and 40, we have a moderate effusion. If it's more than 40 centimeters uh, uh, to the square, you have a large pleural effusion. Another important utility of uh, the transesophageal uh, echo in liver transplantation is to determine if uh, the patient will be able to tolerate the partial IVC clamp as per the classic piggyback technique for side uh, by side caval anastomosis. Uh, in this situation, you want to pay attention to the possibility of LVOT flow acceleration and SAM in hypovolemic states. In this case, uh, there wasn't LVOT gradient, neither flow acceleration, and the patient was able to tolerate relatively uh, well hypovolemia despite asymmetric septal hypertrophy of uh, the left ventricle. Finally, you want to assess both uh, ventricles after the clamp is released, uh, but most importantly, you want to check how severe is the TR post-transplant to determine how this will impact uh, your new liver. In our case, uh, we still have like severe tachyspid regurgitation with even more uh, hepatic vein uh, flow reversal. 
The last case that we are presenting is a 74-year-old gentleman with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, double lung transplant with uh, dyslipidemia and GERD, normal echo set for uh, an, uh, partial function of the right coronary cusp and left coronary cusp of the artery valve, but without AS or AI with uh, mild pulmonary hypertension. The indication uh, for T in this case was after the transplant was uh, done, uh, the surgeons and the anesthesia team was unable to win the patient from BA ECMO due to high peer pressures. So we were calling and we, probe, uh, we put the probe in. So that was on 1.5 liters where they got the stock because the patient got hypovolemic. So on minimal ECMO support, we check the right ventricular function to see how it was tolerating these PA pressures, which uh, by the way, this right ventricle didn't look uh, so great. Then we went into the stomach and assess the LV for volume status. As you can see here, the LV look very hyperdynamic and underfilled. In this situation, every time that we try to win from the ECMO flows, the RV will worsen its function and the PA pressures will rise. So we decide and check uh, the pulmonary veins. In this case, the left upper pulmonary vein was assessed and we recorded high velocities uh, in this vein. The other three pulmonary veins were uh, seen and they were normal with normal pressures. So how much is too much uh, pressure in a pulmonary vein? So the recommendation is not to have a flow more than one meter per second, not to have a gradient between the pulmonary vein and the left atrium more than 10, 12 millimeters per mercury and half a diameter, which is going to be smaller than five millimeters. Those are criteria for pulmonary vein stenosis and it used to happen up to 1% intraoperatively. So after the anastomosis in the left upper pulmonary vein was redone, the velocities were back to normal. So then we needed to win from ECMO again, and we started at three liters per minute, and progressively we went down Normally you go down by 0.5 liters per minute every five minutes until the decannulation. And you need to check the whole time for RV dysfunction and the cusp regurgitation. So you can see here, this is a 2.7. And again, you want to see it in the long axis view. You want to check at the same time that the patient is thermodynamically stable, that you have an adequate, an adequate PA FiO2 ratio and you have a good long compliance. And always remember to check for your TR. And we keep winning down 2.3, 2 liters. You keep going 1.5, 1. And finally, off. Thank you very much uh, for listening. And I'm waiting for your questions.